As you might have heard last week, Google DeepMind and OpenAI shared the gold medal at the Math Olympia. But this time, DeepMind is on the verge of making history in math, cracking the $1 million Navier Stokes problem, one of the seven legendary Millennium Prize challenges. Damas Hassabis appeared on the Lex Friedman podcast and laid out his plans for a new era of scientific discovery. And he revealed that, surprisingly, a model like VO3 that seems more like a toy plays an important role in his vision. And to wrap it all up, I'm introducing a new segment called artificial gems. Just a few interesting, mind-blowing, and sometimes just bizarre projects from the world of AI. So just stick around for that at the end and let's get into it. A Spanish mathematician Javier Gomez Serrano and Google DeepMind team up to solve the Navier Stokes million dollar problem. The project was kept as a complete secret until Demis Hassabes let it slip in a January interview that they are close to solving a millennium prize problem without mentioning which one. Then months later Javier Gomez Serrano who teaches at the Brown University revealed that he has been working with DeepMind to try to soon solve the Navier Stokes challenge, one of the most devilish enigmas known to humans. They have been working on the project with a team of 20 people for more than three years, and the solution is reportedly imminent. The Navier-Stokes equations represent the fundamental laws governing the motion of fluids. They are used in a vast array of applications, from forecasting the weather and modeling airflow around airplanes to predicting the flow of water in pipes and even the circulation of blood in our veins. But why is there a million dollar prize attached to these equations? In 2000, the Clay Mathematics Institute designed the Navier-Stokes existence and smoothness problem as one of its seven millennium prize problems, offering $1 million for a solution. The problem is, despite their wide range of practical use, we don't have a complete theoretical understanding of the solutions to these equations. The existence question asks, will there always be an answer? Will the equation always give you a valid deterministic outcome? Outcome, or could you put in some perfectly reasonable starting conditions and have the equation break? Right now, we can't prove that a solution always exists for any reasonable starting condition. The smoothness question asks, will the flow behave nicely? Starting from a reasonable initial condition, do the equations ever lead to a point where the velocity of the fluid becomes infinite or undefined, which is known as a singularity or blow up? But why does this matter so much? If we could prove that the solutions are always smooth, it would mean that even in the most chaotic looking turbulence, there is an underlying order that we can in theory understand and predict. It would give us much stronger foundation for all the computer simulations we run, confirming that the virtual worlds we create to design everything from airplanes to artificial hearts are based on solid mathematical ground. And if we prove the opposite, that the solutions are not always smooth, it would reveal a fundamental crack in our understanding of the physical world. This would mean our core equations for fluid motion can predict their own failure by forming a singularity, a theoretical point where velocity becomes infinite. It would force the physicists to hunt for a new deeper theory to explain what happens when turbulence is pushed beyond the limits of classical physics, or just accept that these systems are not in fact deterministic. It's called a singularity because just like a black hole, it could mean that the universe, as described by these classical laws, can evolve to a state from which the future is no longer determined. The most interesting question though is what makes Javier Gomez and DeepMind think that they can solve a virtually impossible problem. Javier Gomez says the Navier-Stokes problem is tremendously difficult. People haven't been successful using traditional mathematics. What sets our strategy apart from everyone else's so far is the use of artificial intelligence. That's the advantage we have and we think it can work. I'm optimistic. Progress is very, very rapid. Interestingly, as it appears, DeepMind is trying to simulate the blow-up or the singularity scenario, basically finding a counterexample to the smoothness problem using AI. They are aiming to find the conditions under which velocity or pressure become infinite or undefined in finite time, which would resolve the problem by showing that the solutions are not always smooth. We'll get to that in a second, but let's first hear from our today's sponsor, Skywork. Normally, I'd spend hours reading a brand's video brief to just pull out the requirements. But now I fed the entire document to the Skywork itself and asked for an overview and a set of slides to structure this video. This is possible with the Skywork, your agent-powered workspace that turns a single command into a finished project. It's designed to skip the grind of researching and formatting. Skywork can generate five different types of content 
documents, slides, spreadsheets, web pages, and even podcasts from one prompt, cutting your work time by up to 90%. But what really sets Skywork apart is its research engine. It has its own deep research framework that goes deeper than competitors like Manis or GenSpark, surfacing 10 times more source material at just 40% of the cost. A lot of you asked how MemOS differs from the MemGPT after the last video. So I had a Skywork and Manis write comparison essays. Manis gave me a basic text summary pulled straight from papers. But the Skywork went all in. Hundreds of searches, reviewing real-world use cases, reading benchmarks, comparisons, and user reviews, and turned it into a polished essay with a table of contents, interactive charts, and nearly 50 sources. This is a ready-to-use essay. And when you're ready, everything is live editable and exports directly to your local files or Google Workspace for seamless team collaboration. So if you do any sort of research or office work, it's time to stop working harder and start working smarter. Click the link in the description to try a Skywork for yourself. Thank you again, Skywork, for sponsoring this video. Demis Hasabis believes they are about a year away from a solution. And Javier Gomez says in a more cautious prediction, the solution will arrive sometime in the next five years. Either way, DeepMind has shown again and again that it can take on these massive scientific challenges and actually deliver. And while solving a millennium prize problem would be historic, we have a bigger story next. DeepMind, as Demis Hassabis has said before, is establishing a method to unlock an entirely new era of scientific discovery. He again explained in his interview with Lex Friedman that this isn't just about solving a problem, it's about changing how we do science altogether. And Google's video generator VO3 might be one of the strongest signs that this method is actually working. Let's take a step back to understand the genius of DeepMind's approach here. How does a great scientific leap like Einstein's relativity normally happen? It begins not with an answer, but an instinct. A deep feel for the rules of the game. This intuition fuels countless thought experiments where a lot of bizarre scenarios are imagined and explored. Einstein pictured himself in a falling elevator. He mentally chased the beams of light. These ideas are then tested against reality. And with each result, success or failure, they refine the original intuition. After looping through this process again and again, the intuition becomes a mirror of reality, and the scientist can finally formalize and share it. That is the moment of discovery. DeepMind is now recreating the scientific process, but with a superhuman intensity. At its core, there is an intuition machine, a model that internalizes the fundamental dynamics of a system. Bolted on top is a search algorithm that explores the space of possibilities that the model allows. The search can push into entirely novel regions, the places that no one would have thought to explore, leading to potentially a new insight or understanding. Just like the famous Move 37 that AlphaGo played against the world champion Lee Sedol, an instant classic in AI history. At its core, AlphaGo was an intuition machine, trained on millions of Go games, assisted by a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm layered on top, which explored the moves that the intuition engine considered promising. That combination, a strong intuition and modeling assisted by relentless search, is what allowed AlphaGo to make a move no human ever would have imagined. And that is what's about to happen in every scientific field. So if you think about, uh, again, br b b breaking down the sy solar systems we've built uh, to their really fundamental core, you've got like the model of the of the underlying dynamics of the system. Uh, and then if you want to discover something new, something novel that hasn't been seen before, um, then you need some kind of search process on top to take you to a novel region of the of the of the search space and um you can do that in a number of ways evolutionary computing is one um with AlphaGo, we just use monte carlo tree search right and that's what found move 37 the new uh, kind of never seen before strategy in go and so that's how you can go beyond potentially what is already known so the model can model everything that you currently know about right all the data that you currently have but then how do you go beyond that so that starts to speak about the ideas of creativity how can these systems create something Something new, fight, discover something new. Obviously, this is super relevant for scientific discovery or pushing science and medicine forward, which we want to do with these systems. And you can actually 
bolt on some uh, fairly simple search systems on top of these models and get you into a new region of space. Of course, you also have to um, make sure that uh, you're not searching that space totally randomly, it would be too big. So you have to have some objective function that you're trying to optimize and hill climb towards and that guides that search. Now here's the significance of VO3 in this picture and why it actually surprised every AI scientist. If you were to ask me five, 10 years ago, I would have said, even though I was immersed in all of this, I would have said, well, yeah, you probably need to understand intuitive physics. Yeah. You know, like if I push this off the table, this glass, it will maybe shatter, you know, um, and, the, and the liquid will spill out, right? So we know all of these things. But I thought that, you know, and there's a lot of theories in neuroscience, it's called action in perception, where, you know, you, you need to act in the world to really, truly perceive it in a deep way. And there was a lot of theories about you need embodied intelligence or robotics or something, or maybe at least simulated action uh, so that you would understand things like intuitive physics. But it seems like um, you can understand it through passive observation, which is pretty surprising to me. And and again, I think hints at something underlying about the nature of reality. Uh, reality in, in, in my opinion beyond um, just the you know the cool videos that it generates this machine has an understanding of fluid dynamics light material interactions and even chaotic unpredictable systems at a level that goes far beyond anything we can easily explain and while it is not a scientific tool it demonstrates how far modeling super complex dynamic systems can go alpha fold is a perfect example of this in biology the main engine solved protein folding and is now moving beyond that modeling more and more complex systems. AlphaFold 3 is doing protein RNA DNA interactions, mm -hmm. which is super complicated and fascinating that's uh, amenable to modeling. Alpha Genome uh, predicts uh, how small genetic changes. And so virtual cell, which is what I call the project of modeling a cell, uh, I've had this idea, you know, of wanting to do that for maybe more like 25 years. And uh, I used to talk with Paul Nurse, what would you need to model of the full internals of a cell so that you could do experiments on the virtual cell and what those experiments, you know, in silico, and those predictions would be useful for you to save you a lot of time in the wet lab, right? That would be the dream. Maybe you could 100x speed up experiments by doing most of it in silico the search in silico and then you do the validation step in the wet lab that would be that's the that's the dream and so uh, but maybe now finally uh so i was trying to build these components alpha fold being one that that would uh, allow you eventually to model the full interaction a full simulation of a cell and i'd probably start with a yeast cell and partly that's what Paul Nurse studied because the yeast cell is like a full organism that's a single cell, right? So it's the kind of simplest single cell organism. And so it's not just a cell, it's a full organism. And, um, and yeast is very well understood. And so that would be a good candidate for uh, a, a, a kind of full simulated model. Now, AlphaFold is the is the solution to the kind of static picture of what does a what does a protein look, 3D structure of protein look like, a static picture of it. But we know that biology, all the interesting things happen with the dynamics, the interactions. And that's what AlphaFold 3 is is the first step towards is modeling those interactions. So first of all, pairwise, you know, proteins with proteins, proteins with RNA and DNA. But then um, the next step after that would be modeling maybe a whole pathway, maybe like the Tor pathway that's involved in cancer or something like this. And then eventually you might be able to model, you know, a whole cell. And when the virtual cell happens, scientists can run massive search algorithms on top to find really novel breakthroughs. These breakthroughs are just impossible to imagine now. So being able to simulate the first from from non-living organisms, the the birth of a living organism. I don't see why not, why AI couldn't help with that, some kind of simulation. Again, it's again, it's a bit of a search process through a combinatorial space. Here's like all the, you know, the chemical soup that, that you start with, the primordial soup that, you know, maybe was on earth near these hot vents. Here's some initial conditions. Can you uh, generate something that looks like a cell? So perhaps that would be a next stage after the virtual cell project is, well, how, how could you actually um, something like that emerge from the chemical soup? These are not just future dreams. Places like the isomorphic labs are already running search on top of the protein modeling to find novel drug compounds for various diseases. Listen how amazed are the scientists with the capabilities unlocked by this AI. Is, is that realistic, Max? This isn't going to happen overnight, let's be clear. But I think the exciting thing is that we can actually see there's perhaps a practical path 
towards that point. And it's very different at this point in time than it has ever been because we've got these AI machine learning models that understand the biological world and the biochemical world in a completely different manner than what we've had before. And so that's opening up you know, tons of disease space that we didn't think was tractable before. Uh, and that's just today. So as we start to develop these models further and further, it's really just the very beginning. Does that mean every, I mean, every disease is on the table here, Becky? So I would say you know, nothing is off the table at this point. And, you know, the journey for me here has you know, been a big one. I used to be much more conservative in this space. But having come to isomorphic labs, seeing, you know, the kind of models that we have, things that I thought in the past we would never be able to predict and now being able to do it every day within, you know, five, ten seconds, um, it's completely shifted my mindset. So now I would put nothing off the table. These models and, you know, can start finding completely novel chemical matter for completely novel you know, mechanisms that, that no one's really discovered before, which is mind-blowing for me as yeah. a computer scientist. Yeah, that's mind-blowing for me. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some, like, um, almost like career-defining moments, like where, you know, the AI will or the, will give you a hypothesis, right? It will, it will suggest something, and you think, like, I I'm not convinced I would do that, but the model's telling me this thing, and it's really co quite convinced about this thing, so I should maybe just test this hypothesis. And then, actually, it turns out, that the model was right um, and you were absolutely right to test it and it's really pushed forward your your project or even like that kind of field. So um, I think for me, it's not about how we trust the models. It's about how we are open to testing the hypotheses that they put in front of us um, and not sort of going, oh, that, that doesn't fit with my worldview, so I'm not going to test it. But then you are also human, right? right. <laughs> so I do wonder whether if you see, you know, lots of, uh, of hits with the model, as it were, if, if yeah. the model is coming up with lots of good stuff in a row, do you start so maybe trusting it more than yourself? We actually put a lot of trust in the models. We actually use, for example, some of the models we have, we use them as quite strict cutoffs. What kind of cutoff? Like, for example, we have a model which we call binding probability, and it goes from zero to one. So one is, um, you know, the model is convinced your, models, your molecule is definitely going to bind to your protein. Zero, the model is telling you this is definitely not going to bind. And, you know, when you can build a little bit of confidence over time that the model really does understand uh, okay, anything below 0.7, it's really got a very low probability of success. So we just def define that as a cutoff and be like, we're not going to put anything in the lab that's got a probability of less than this because actually the model's quite likely to be right. It's probably not going to be any good. And so you do, even though, and that's quite hard because as a chemist, you design something and you think, that was a really clever idea that I just came <laughs> up with. And like, why doesn't it like it? <laughs> Surprisingly, this doesn't replace scientists. It complements them in a powerful way. The AI models the vast space of possibilities, while the human scientist guides the search with the kind of research taste that AI doesn't have. Then the AI performs its superhuman search. And finally, it's the human's contextual understanding and ability to formalize the results that completes the loop. Together, this partnership, as Damas Hassab has said, is unlocking a new age of scientific discovery. In some sense, there is nothing new here. DeepMind has already done this with AlphaGo, AlphaProof, AlphaEvolve, and so many more. But in another sense, we are only now beginning to pull all the pieces together. We are on the verge of moving science forward at an unprecedented speed. Alright, welcome to the Artificial Gems, where we showcase some of the most interesting, awe-inspiring, or sometimes weird projects in the world of AI. Let's get into it. The first project is from Tech Hala, a beautiful pixel art animation. Very cool project done with AI using static pictures and JSON prompting. Then there is the weird project from UK engineers making some mushrooms play piano. The robotic arms are picking on the mushrooms electrical impulses and they somehow play piano. I'm not sure if the mushrooms are trained or something but it looks so bizarre that I thought it definitely belongs here.
And the last one is from Salma, a new style of prompting VO3 that gives you these beautiful special effects, perfect for commercials. They are all over the Twitter now. Take a look. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.